Hi, listeners. Welcome back to Motivate, the motivation and inspiration podcast. I'm your host, Dahi D, and today's guest is Tim Ferriss talking about why you need a sense of urgency. Urgency is critical to get the job done. If you think you have all the time in the world to achieve your goals, it only hurts when you realize that your time is finite. It's finite by a few different ways, but think about it like this. On one hand, you think you have all the time in the world to work your job and just focus on your goals in the future. But on the other hand, you know AI is coming and it might just automate your job out of existence. So that's one way. Another more important way is that you have to understand that one day you're going to die. And that day might be tomorrow or it might be 10 years from now. No matter how much time you have left, whatever goals you have need to be achieved. And if you understand that you don't have much time, that means you need to spend every waking moment working on these goals. That's it for me today. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'm going to take a question from one of the private Facebook groups where I do various experiments. And this question is from Christian B. While reading and living Stoicism, how do you avoid spending too much time thinking about the inevitability of death and how do you harness it to empower you rather than scare or overwhelm you? So let's begin with a definition of terms. Stoicism or Stoic philosophy, very simply, and this is going to be simplified for any academics out there who want to poke holes in it, is a philosophical system that focuses on separating the things you can control from the things you cannot control and then instills in your daily practice habits and exercises such that you can focus as much of your energy as possible on things you can control. Part of Stoicism is meditating on death, certain inevitabilities, and finding freedom in that instead of overwhelm. All right, that sounds very nice and theoretical and conceptual. What does that mean in practice? I spend an amount of time that might seem ridiculous reminding myself of death. And this sounds morbid, but it is very valuable to me because it emphasizes the impermanence and the short duration of life that we have, which gives me a sense of urgency to pursue the things that are important. It gives me a sense of urgency in having the uncomfortable conversations that are so important in life, that can define the next chapters of your life, that can change your life. And without a sense of urgency, when you sort of cover your eyes and ears to not think about death, it is easy to push things off to tomorrow, to tomorrow, to tomorrow, until you die <laughs> and it's too late and you would have benefited from asking those uncomfortable questions, taking those uncomfortable actions far sooner. So. I have, for instance, a Memento Mori coin made by a friend of mine and author, Ryan Holiday, well known for his writing on Stoicism, which acts as a visual reminder. I have different quotes that are laser etched onto driftwood that also serve this purpose. And for that reason, Christian, I, I don't try to avoid spending too much time thinking about the inevitability of death. And the way that, at least, I find it empowering instead of overwhelming is to recognize, A, it's outside of your control. B, it happens to everyone. And C, you can control, in a sense, or hone your perception of death and view it as a catalyzing help as opposed to a, an overwhelming sadness. And... One practice that might seem unusual that I have found very valuable, and this harkens back to an anecdote or maybe an allegory of sorts that I was told by Tara Brock, famous meditation teacher, and that is a famous sage once said, the only question worth asking is, what are you unwilling to feel? So as you think about death and how you relate to death, you may also think about how you relate to other emotions you don't want to feel. For me, particularly with a history of depression up until, say, five years ago, where I have not had any major depressive episodes in the last five years, and then I think in part what I'm going to describe has been very helpful for staving off depression, 
I optimized for positive, 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 positive. Meaning, I wanted as many moments in my day to be purely positive as possible. I did not want to feel sad. I did not want to feel tired. I did not want to feel angry, so on and so forth. Those emotions are going to surface. And when you have labeled them as bad and try to refuse them with as much mental willpower and emotional willpower as possible, what you resist tends to persist. And those things have an outsized impact on your life, negative impact. Conversely, if you use, and here's the practice, say minor key music, which I had not used until a few years ago. Didn't listen to minor key music and just look up minor key piano music to get a taste for what this sounds like. It instills melancholy. It has a sad sound to it. And I've, I've begun listening to music that evokes that type of feeling deliberately because at the end of listening to this music for say five to 10 minutes, and then you play another track that has a more upbeat feeling to it, say a lot of bossa nova from Brazil, you realize that the sadness, much like excitement, is transient, and that your psyche is porous in that sense. The excitement flows into you, and then it flows out of you. Not literally, but of course that is the subjective experience. And that's also true of sadness, which a lot of us try to avoid. And when you realize how transient that is and how you can turn it on and turn it off with cues in your environment, it becomes less intimidating. It becomes less overwhelming. You can use films in the same way, watching films that are scary, sad, depressive, whatever it might be, and then contrasting that with something that is on the opposite end of the spectrum. That is a practice. In other words, seeking out artistic cues that catalyze emotions historically you've tried to avoid that transcends the practice itself and helps you to relate differently to things like death. Because most likely what you fear or what you find um, abhorrent is not so much death itself, but the way that you're emotionally relating to the concept or definition of death. I know that sounds very, very abstract. But that is one way that I've approached this. In controlled legal settings, I will also say that transcendent psychedelic experiences can greatly remove a fear of death. Uh, I think that relates to some of the phenomenology, aka subjective reports of a feeling of fusing with source consciousness. But we're going to get off into crazy town talk real fast if we continue with discussing that particular aspect of my own uh, personal journey. Nonetheless, in uh, legal, safe, supervised settings, that is also a tool in the toolkit. It can be an overused tool in the toolkit, but nonetheless, it is, it is one tool. Similarly, uh, there are questions you can ask that I think show you or showcase the value of keeping death in mind such as uh, one question, and I'm going to paraphrase this. This is from Munib Ali, who was in Tribe of Mentors. And I believe the question I asked him was, what do you do when you feel scattered or overwhelmed? And his response, and Munib, I apologize if I'm not getting this uh, completely right, but it's paraphrased, and I do use this a lot. When you are experiencing something simple, laying in a warm bed, uh, an example that comes to mind for me is laying in a hammock, watching my dog Molly play with a stick. When you are on your deathbed, how much would you pay? Or even 20 years from now, how much would you pay to relive this experience right now? And very often that number gets quite high. Maybe it's something that you physically might not be able to do 30 years from now, 40 years from now. I was just skiing a few days ago and had a wonderful experience with two of my closest friends. What would I pay? 40 years from now, to have that day back and experience that. And think about it. Don't throw away that question and uh, make up a number. Really think about what you might spend. And I think that highlights the value of experience relative to this decay that we all experience past a certain point on our descent to death. 
And uh, those are a few of the ways that I try to harness mortality to empower and enrich my life as opposed to disabling or distracting, if that makes sense. So those are a few tips, a few recommendations that have been deeply helpful to me. And if you'd like to learn more about Stoicism, then I would suggest you Google Tao of Seneca, T-A-O of Seneca. Seneca being one of the foremost writers or best known writers as it relates to Stoic philosophy. I put together three large PDFs that are available for free with original artwork and all sorts of fun stuff that dig deeper into the practical applications of Stoic philosophy.